want to just take a moment and appreciate this atmosphere. This ground that we're standing on, while I know you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, this ground that we're standing on is holy ground. There are dimensions of his glory, but this is without doubt holy ground. And I never want you to take that for granted. You know, every now and then when, you know, some of our folks may complain about some things, I say, take a few field trips. Yeah, you'll, you'll get that when you go home. This is a special place. The assumption is that the glory of God is, is as palpable everywhere as it is here. And I'm here to tell you, I go a lot of places and that is not the case. That the integrity of leadership of your leaders and their heart to hear God and to align to God's will, no matter the cost, is everywhere. I wish I could tell you that's everywhere, but it's not. There's some places that I go and they master the art of the illusion that God is in the place. Because you can go through the same external motions without there being the true felt sense of God's presence. And I'm not talking about the omnipresence of God, God being everywhere at once. I'm talking about the manifest presence of God, the presence of God that shows up and makes a difference, the presence of God that shifts our mind and shifts our heart and heals our bodies and gives us words about our life that no we told no one about and this is a place where the presence of God is real and is active and God has strategic you strategically placed you raised you up for we praise God for all the things he's done historically but he's raised you up for such a time as this where people are watching church decline and scratching their heads trying to figure out what the future of the kingdom is given the cultural landscape shifting you are engaging it and expanding and advancing God's kingdom and I want you to understand that is not happening everywhere so if you would help me first of all give it up for the place that you're standing give it up I'm not gonna have you do much of this, but look at your neighbor real quick. So I love my church. Shoo. I love my I love my church. If they didn't do that, shoo, watch them, watch them. They may. But then secondly, I, I just um I don't know about you. You look like y'all have all smiling faces, like all your relationships are great and and that everybody you interact with is solid. But, but, but I don't know about you, this world gets kind of tricky. It's, you know, you think you know people and you find out you don't know people like you thought you knew people and the people that you counted out step up and the people that you counted on step out. Anybody, anybody ever been there? What I found is there is a deep longing for all of us. There's this deep longing. And the longing is ultimately for a place that our heart can rest. Yeah, and I know that you say, oh, that's in Jesus. That, that's great. That's true. But we need also, and God understood this, if it was just in the Lord, he would have just left Adam alone in the garden. And if it was just in the Lord, he wouldn't cause us to gather together and to not forsake the fellowship. But we need people that our heart can rest with who are stable, who are, who are solid, who celebrate us in our victories and without a hater's bone in their body and cry with us when we cry, that, that are consistent, that are the same this time five years later than they were five years before. If you have anybody in your life like that, holler back at your boy real quick. And I want to tell you why I celebrate your pastor, I celebrate your pastors, Pastor Torre and Pastor Sarah, but I, I celebrate my, my dear friend, Pastor Torre Roberts, because he has, in this crazy world, been a solid place for my heart to rest. He has been consistent. He hasn't changed in a way that has brought isolation, but he is there in 
And I want to praise God for people like that, for pastors like that. We thank God for him hearing the voice of God. We thank God for him continuing to advance the kingdom. But shoot, maybe, maybe I'm just thinking naturally right now. I thank God just for a solid person in my life. And I want you to know you have one of the most solid pastors in the world. Are you here with me? And every chance you get, you ought to celebrate him and Pastor Sarah. Every chance you get. I mean, do I have any Peters in the house? A good church. I always want a couple Peters around me. You know, Peter, they went to go put the hand on Jesus. Peter didn't even think about it. He just started cutting people's ears off. Now, it wasn't righteous. You know, Jesus rebuked him softly. You know, he's like, just watch that, man. Careful. But I need folks around me that know how to lay hands and pray. But I need a couple people that know how to lay hands, too, just in case. Even if they don't do it, just, I mean, do, does anybody need a friend like me? Like, I'll cut you if you talk about my friend, like, again. And you may not cut them, you just pull something out and just flash it. Listen, that's me. Listen, let somebody roll up or talk about your pastor. I have... I keep something in my back pocket from time to time just to flash. Just, now forget, look at your neighbor if this is the first time. Tell him he's just playing. He's just playing. <laughs> but we're grateful for them and <laughs> grateful for this time that we have to share together. If you would, just put your arm around someone. If you want to grab hands, you can grab hands. If you're a, a germaphobe, just put your elbow on their elbow. <laughs> And so, Father, here it is. Again, we're in your presence. Here we are, Lord. We have sang songs, psalms of ascent. We've gone progressively higher with every word uttered, with our hearts inclined towards you, Father. Now we ask, as we have entered into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise, when we got into the presence we worshiped, so now, Lord, we ask that you speak to us. Speak to us a word that will leave us forever changed, one that will take us from where we are to where you've called us to be, and we'll give you glory, we'll give you honor, we'll give you praise. Now break every limitation, every boundary, every border, everything that has kept us from our God-given destiny. We want everything you have for us, and we're determined that we're not leaving this place without it. And so now do your good work in us, through us, and we'll give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ, all those who agree with the prayer, let me hear you shout amen. Now grab your Bibles, if you would, meet me in Deuteronomy 34, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 34, Deuteronomy 34, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 34. When you get there, say something. You're not there yet. <laughs> and it reads, Now Moses went up to the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, and all of Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh. And all the land of Judah as far as the western sea and the Negev and the plain in the valley of Jericho. The city of the palm trees as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, this is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no man knows his burial place to this day. Although Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eye was not dim, nor his vigor abated. He still had his strength. Right before you take your seats, if you would look at about three people and tell them God is moving you past your limitations. 
tell them God. Yeah. One of my greatest nightmares was being alive but irrelevant. Another way of putting it for me to give you a sense of the fears I used to live with. I'm not Usher Raymond, but these are my confessions. One of my fears was being able to see divine possibilities that I don't take part in. Being on the verge of attaining what it is I can see, what I've been dreaming about, what, I, what has been promised to me, but never up apprehending it. Moses knew what that was like. Moses get this, lived or walked with the children of Israel. He led them out of Egypt by the mighty hand of God and walked in the wilderness on an 11-day journey for 40 years with the promise that I'm bringing you into the land flowing with milk and honey. God's description of this promised land was so Specific, I'm sure they would imagine it as they slept at night. Yet, he walked around the wilderness on the 11 days journey for 40 years. Can you imagine that? Well, you, you've been in L.A. traffic, so you know what that's like. <laughs> Does anybody know what it is to be five minutes away for an hour? He gets to the verge of this promised land, all that God's been promising him, everything he told him he would have. And as he gets to the verge of this promised land, God says, I want you to climb up, climb up to Mount Pisgah, get to the edge. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look out at all this land. He said, this is what you have been working toward. This is what you were to bring the children of Israel into. This is the land that I promised you, the land flowing with milk and honey. This is your promised land. He said, Moses, this is your promised land. I want you to take a look at it. He said, but you're not going in. You'll not enter the place that I'm showing to you, the place that you've been believing me for. He said, you can see it, but you won't go in. It wasn't that Moses was weak as a leader. The Bible said he was still strong. His Physical sight was still strong, yet what got him to this place is while his physical sight was strong, his spiritual sight had been diminished. Many of you know the story. What led him to this place and what kept him from going into the place that God had for him is the people of Israel began to complain again about there being no Water. They were thirsty. They said, Moses, we've been out here in this wilderness. We need some water. It's, it's dry. It's, it's hot. We need some water. Moses, the first time that the children of Israel asked for water with no 7-Eleven, with no AMPM anywhere to be seen, there was no slurpy machines. But God supernaturally, with the rod of Moses, told Moses, if you strike or hit this rock, water will come out. He struck the rock, water then poured out of the rock, and everyone was able to drink. Now they again, after mi they've experienced miracle after miracle, are on the verge of going into the promised land, what God had promised them, and they're thirsty again. Ironically, they're thirsty again. Moses looks to God and said, God, um... Your people need some water. God says, all right, here's what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to, this time, don't strike the rock. I want you to speak. Open up your mouth. Don't hit it. Open up your mouth and speak to the rock. When you speak to the rock, water will come out of the rock the same way it did when you struck it. 
So Moses, as the Bible says, according to the Lord's instruction, gathered all the people for them to witness and listen to his words. He says, shall we bring water from the rock for you? He lifts up the rod. Even though God told him to speak to the rock and water will come out, he lifts up the rod and decides he knows what to do. So he takes the rod, strikes the rock, water comes out. But he disobeyed God. God said, I'm allow you to see the promise, but you will not walk into the promise because you broke faith as it relates to this step in the journey with me. Now, I wish I had time to work this like I want to, but I don't. Let me rush this real quick. But if, if I could take my time, what I would tell you is be very careful uh, simply because you get results. <laughs> Moses disobeyed God and still got water out of the rock, which reveals that we can be walking in disobedience with external results. That's why you have to be discerning. When I walked up in here, I said, I know the difference in between a church that masters the art of the illusion that God is in the place and where the spirit of God is really moving in their midst. Are you still here with me? Because I've been in houses where people were in disobedience but still got the results. Never assume that you're walking rightly with God simply because the results produced in your life are you still here with me so he says Moses you are going to see it but you're not gonna go now I know you know Moses in this narrative as one of miracles the one where Moses stood at the edge of the Red Sea lifted up his rod the Red Sea's part of the Moses that prayed to God when they were hungry and God sent bread from heaven the Moses that struck the rock and water poured out of the rock the Moses that allowed the children of Israel led the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years and they never the tread of their soles on their shoes never wore out. Nike and Reebok are still trying to get the patent on those soles. Are you with me? I know you know the Moses of miracles. But do you know what I see when I look at the other side of the Moses narrative? I see a narrative not only of the supernatural, but I see a narrative of limitation. Be careful when you read the Bible not to only see the superhero stuff. Learn to look at the humanity when you look at the scripture, not only the victories as we gravitate toward, but that is why we feel that there's such a pronounced difference between us and biblical characters because we've learned to see their victories without seeing their flaws. We've learned to see, see or celebrate the supernatural without understanding the natural limitation. And as I look at the Bible, I find Moses' narrative is one of limitation. Say limitation. Yeah, I want to talk to you today about divine limitation. Yeah, Moses, first of all, starts his miracle, sees God speaking from a burning bush, is God's moving by the power of his spirit. He sees supernatural things, and he gets ready to send Moses to his assignment to speak to Pharaoh. What does Moses say? Um... Uh, God, um, whether he was plagued of speech, lacked confidence, or whether he stuttered, the original language could be any of those things. But here's the idea. Moses saw supernatural miracles from God. God says, okay, now you're ready to go. Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses looks back at this supernatural God and says, but God, I can't speak. Do you see it? He starts his ministry in limitation. Not only does he have a limitation of speech and a limitation of ability, you saw all the miracles, but he also has a limitation in his leadership. He led millions out of Egypt, and every time there was a conflict, they brought the conflict to Moses. Moses would resolve the conflict, and by the time he got to the end of his day, he wasn't communing with God. He wasn't hearing for the future. He wasn't thinking strategically as a leader. But he just barely got through the day dealing with people management. Jethro, his father-in-law, says, listen to me. What you're doing is all wrong. This will kill you. Though God is moving in you supernaturally, 
You have to put natural systems in place to sustain what God is doing supernaturally. I don't have time to camp out there, but there's some of you that believe everything that you're looking for is going to happen by sowing your miracle seed. Listen, there are certain things that are released in your giving, but there are other things that God wants to release to you. You just don't have the infrastructure to handle it without it killing you because blessing will kill you if you don't have the system to hold the blessing. You want your business scaled? Get the system. Yeah, the revelation gave you the idea. The revelation gave you the concept. The favor of God got you through the door. But what's going to allow you to scale is the administration that follows the revelation. Are you still here with me? Jethro said, Moses, here's your problem. You are anointed, but you're not a good manager. Mm, somebody's limitation right there. You can put your finger up and go right home real quick. Because you've been believing for God to do something. You've been frustrated because of what God has not done. And what you don't realize is you are anointed with your bad gifted self. You have the best ideas in the world, but there are people with ideas that are half as good as yours that have gone three times as far because they took that little bitty idea and they put it in the proper system so that it could be scaled. He said, Moses, you're doing this all wrong. And all my business people holler back at me real quick. He said, what you need to do is you need to have thousands, captains of thousands, of hundreds, or excuse me, captains of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Everybody can do everything. He said, Moses, you're limited. You need to administrate this grace on your life. But then Moses, after the administration, was frustrated once again. He was frustrated this time because... In fact, it was so bad that day on the job. Here's what Moses says. Moses said, Lord, um, and I'm paraphrasing. This is the Wayne Cheney translation, all right? He said, Lord, this is too much for me. These people are about to kill me. And here's what he says to God. Here's his prayer to God. I don't know if you've ever prayed this prayer to God, but this is a bad day on the job. He says, Lord, will you just kill me? He said, that's how bad it is here right now. He said, this role you've given me is so bad. Listen, don't give me a new role. Don't put Aaron in my place and, you know, allow me to go into wilderness wanderings. He said, you know what, God? This has been so bad. Would you just please kill me? And notice God's response. God says, no, I'm not going to kill you, but here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to take from the spirit that is upon you, gather the leaders and the elders. I'm going to take from the spirit that is upon you, he said, and I'm going to put it upon them. This speaks of the Holy Spirit, but not just the Holy Spirit. It speaks of the way in which the Holy Spirit works with that leader. He says, I'm going to take from what is upon you, and I'm going to put it upon them so that they are not only attempting to follow you in leadership based on systems and administration without supernatural grace, but they need the grace that is on your life resting on their life so that this can be accomplished and so that the load can be lifted. Now, can I take a parenthetical pause real quick while your pastor is away this week and tell you he needs more than administrative hands or managers. He needs managers and ministers. Are you still here with me? And I'm not just simply talking about the ones up front praying for you. I'm talking about people who say I'm more than competent with with systems, but I also want to carry the spirit that is at work in this house. I have the Holy Spirit, but I want to be able to address things like my leaders would address things at the parking lot before it ever gets to the office. If I have any managers that are ready to be ministers, let me hear you make some noise real quick. Yeah. Listen. Limitation. Say limitation. Another limitation, the Bible says that he was going, the children of Israel fighting against the Amalekites. The Amalekites were in the valley fighting against, or Israel was in the valley fighting against the Amalekites. Now get this. It says, as they were fighting in the valley, Moses said, I'm going to stand up on the mountain. And as you're down there in the valley fighting, he said, I'm going to intercede on your behalf up here on the mountain. And here's what the Bible said. As long as Moses kept the rod up, they got victory, the children of Israel, Israel, over the Amalekites in the valley. As long as the rod 
was lifted up, the people in the valley got supernatural victory. How do I know a supernatural victory? Because he said, the Bible says, when the rod began to come down because Moses' arms were, were tired, then the children of Israel would begin to lose the battle against the Amalekites in the valley. Seeing this, the Bible declares that Aaron and Ur came and lifted up Moses' arms. And when they lifted up his arms again, the Israelites in the valley got the victory over their enemy. Now, I don't have time to talk about the case for how we follow leaders. Uh, this is what our leaders need, but we also as individuals need people who are lifting up our arms. Now, there's a revelation in the names of the people that lifted up his arms. Aaron was a priest. And Ur means liberty. Here's the idea. On one hand, Moses had intercession. Someone calling out his name and lifting him before God as he's lifting the people before God. Everybody in this place that's called to do anything for God needs to make sure that there's somebody somewhere who's calling your name out to God. As you're lifting up other people, as you're trying to secure the victory, you better have one prayer partner somewhere who who you know will pray for you for real, for real, who's lifting up your arm on one side. And then the Bible declares that he had Earl on the other side, which means liberty. Can I tell you what a good pastor needs? And I can talk about him while he's gone. A good leader needs intercession, people that are lifting him up. But the flip side is they need someone else holding up the other arm, and that is through giving them liberty to function, liberty to do what it is that God's called them to do without saying, you know how good it was back there in the day, I mean, in Egypt? But notice this. Follow me. Limitation. Say limitation. limitation. Now, while God is giving the Israelites supernatural victory in the battle, as Moses' arms are lifted, he refuses to give Moses supernatural strength in his arms. There's sleep over here. Let me try this side. So what I was telling them was when Moses' rod was lifted, God gave supernatural victory to Israel in the valley. Yet God refused to do in Moses' arms what he did in the valley. So while God is, is supernaturally empowering the soldiers in the valley, the one that has his arms lifted is experiencing natural fatigue in his arms. Because God is a God that will do supernatural things through you, but still allow there to be limitation. Does anybody know what it is to pray for others and watch there be victory in their life while you're struggling in the same area? I don't know who I'm talking to, but I came for some real folks who will keep it real with me. You pray for them to get some money. They got the money and you broke. You pray for them to get the job. They got the job and you got laid off. Are you still here with me? You pray for them to be healed. Their body is healed while you're still believing God for your healing. Well, you know what it is to experience limitation. And here Moses through his life and then at the end of his life experiences limitation because he can see the promised land, but he can't walk into it. Whew. Does anybody know what it is to have the dream, but it never become a reality? Mm -hmm. To be holding on to the word, you're not even holding on anymore, you're hanging on. To watch people around you walk into their blessing and you're still believing for yours. Divine limitation. The reason I call it divine limitation is because um, it's not the devil. Oh, I know what to do with that sucker. Yeah, I know what to do with the devil. I, I know how to bind and loose. I, 
I know how to rebuke the devil. I know how to put him back in his proper place. I know how to stand in authority by the name of Jesus Christ and his blood. I know how to reverse curses. I know how to cast out demons. That may be old school, but I know how to do that. I know how to watch God do supernatural things when the enemy is trying to prevent something because the kingdom of God is moving and no devil in hell can stop the movement of the living God. When I mean business when there's anything that stands in the way of the move of God. But what do you do when God stands in the way? <laughs> when it's God, you can't rebuke it. When it's God, you can't cast it away. Uh-oh. When it's God, you can't fast long enough for it to move. I promise you, I don't want, I'm not going to depress you for the rest of this message. When it's, when it's God... The only thing that will get me beyond my limitation is a revelation. I need to find out why God has me limited. I need to find out why God has me stuck. I need to find out why God is feeding me with a vision that he does not let me walk into. Why is God showing me things in my dreams and showing me things in my sleep and showing me divine possibilities that I am not moving into? I came to tell you it's not the devil frustrating you. First of all, let me just clarify some things. It is the Lord. It is the Lord that spoke to you. It is the Lord that gave you the dream. It is the Lord that put favor on your life. It is is the Lord that showed you the possibilities it is the Lord that gave you the revelation but now you need a revelation on how to access what God has shown you I came to talk to some frustrated people I came to prophesy that some things are turning around I guarantee it's going to turn around in your life I'm talking to some people that came into this place with limitations but God says I'm breaking the limitations because I'm the one that put them there but it can be turned around yeah, yeah. Sit, sit down for a minute let me tell you why God creates limitations divine Limitations. Number one, God creates limitations because when we live when the kingdom is our economy and when we live in a place that is saturated, worship in a place and dwell amongst people where the presence of God is rich and where his favor is resonant and where our culture is revival, we assume that this is just the way it's happening everywhere and with everybody. We, it be, we become so used to it that it is the air that we breathe we are like a fish in water does a fish know it's in water I don't know because it's his habitat it's what it wakes up and goes to sleep with it's when you're so used to watching the hand of God for 40 years of a journey sometimes I don't know about you but sometimes it gets difficult to tell when is God when it's me, am I smart? Was that a good idea? Or was that revelation? I'm so used to doors opening when I walk to them. I'm so used to being fulfilled with joy. I'm so used to these things working. I'm so used to there being favor on my life. I'm so used to these things that at some point I can begin to think that it's me and not God. I, I know I'll say that it's the Lord. I know I'll say it's God who woke me up this morning and started me on my way. I know I'll say it's God that kept the roof over my head and clothes on my back. I know I'll say it's in him. I live, move, and have my being. But the reality is it's become so normative that we forget where God begins and we end. I think Moses forgot that. Here's what he says. He gathers the people and said <laughs> he was insecure, dependent on the Lord. If God didn't show up at the beginning of his ministry, he was sunk. He didn't have enough courage to step out on a daily basis. He needed reassurance on a regular basis God are you going to do this God will you be with me 
I'm going up in here, God, but you can't leave me by myself. There comes a point where, as a friend of mine says, everything we build should be on air. If God doesn't speak, it all falls apart. But here is the challenge. As we go further, we move into what Chuck Swindoll says is the danger of ministry. He says the danger of ministry is you can learn how to do it. It can become so mechanical. You become so used to it. Listen to me. We can work communion with God out of it. Intimacy with God out of the equation and then we start to think it is us and not God God says I'm going to break somebody's limitation today and listen I'm going to break your limitation by reminding you that it is not you but reminding you that it's me that opens up the door it's me that makes the way it's me that gave favor it's me that's going to take you to unimaginable heights it's me the giver of the dream that will make the dream the reality but until you get that God says I'm going to create a limitation yeah, I'm not going to let you go further in deception. Moses stood before him and said, should we bring water from this rock? We. Hold up. We. Where were you? Oh, when God starts, yeah, you don't want to get into that. Whenever God limits, number one, it's because at some point we ceased to acknowledge his presence and his work in our lives. Can I tell you another way? Another reason? Another way God limits? God will bring us to a place and allow us to see further but not go further when the relational architecture of our life is not intact. Oh, you thought you were going to do this alone because you grew up in America. No, no, but there's certain things that God is not going to do with you, boo-boo. <laughs> there are certain things that God will only do with us. And can I tell you where some of you are? You have been limited from going further because you've gone as far as God will allow you to go by yourself. That's why Joshua ends up being the one that leads them into the promised land and not Moses because Moses went out front with him and his rod. Joshua said, oh no, I saw that movie. He said, for this new place, I'm not going out there front. Get the priest. Let them go out with the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God, and they'll go into the promised land to set the pattern as a company and not as an individual because God is concerned with the relational architecture of our life. And that is what I love about this place. It is not just that you are going to get your breakthrough or you get a breakthrough and you get a breakthrough. No, it's we at some point are going to get a breakthrough. There are certain things you're not big enough. You're not anointed enough to do by yourself but you need me to move into that destiny with you. But God knows us, and he knows we don't just sign up for that. So what God will do is, because his goal is to maximize what he does, say maximize. It is to pull us both vertically and horizontally. It is to pull us toward himself and to one another. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. That's toward him. But then you're to love your neighbor as yourself. The challenge is not with me loving God. Often the challenge is with me loving my neighbor. God is not the one who hurt me. God is not the one who gossiped about me. God is not the one. You don't, God doesn't look like the one that messed me up. Are you still here with me? So it is easy or to commune with God but to neglect interpersonal relationship but God says because the goal is to move you forward collectively he said I'm going to create divine blind spots write that down divine blind spots what is a divine blind spot a divine blind spot is when God wants to draw you toward himself he will not put the answer in anyone else not your prayer partner not your auntie not your grandmother, not big mama 
Are you still with me? When God wants to draw you toward himself, he will not put the answer in anyone else, but will require for you to personally commune with him in order to get what it is you're in need of. But the flip side is, when God wants to draw you to other people, he will not give you what you need alone in your relationship with him, communing with him. I don't care how much you pray in the spirit or connect to God, when God wants you drawn toward other people, he'll hear your prayers but put the answer to your prayer in some human relationship so that you love him but when they bring to you what you stood in need of to get to your next place you love the Lord your God with all your heart, might and strength for sending them but you also love your neighbor as yourself and God says some of you in this place are limited from going to your next place because you still have an issue you with people and I don't care what your personality profile is I'm an introvert too baby but God is not bringing me into my destiny in isolation look at somebody tell them we, we got to go into this together yeah 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 you've been lied to by some folks you have to go through this together God will leave your behind right there on Mount Pisgah let you see possibilities you'll never walk in as long as you sit in the back and just come to peep in because you were hurt by your last church you better get over being hurt by your last church and jump in with both feet into the pool and say as for me and my house we're going to connect up in here Give somebody a high five. Tell them I'm connected. I'm connected. I got to connect. I got to connect. I got to connect. I got to get past my hangups. I got to get past my issues. I got to get past my hurts because my destiny is connected to me. <laughs> connected with somebody. Sit down for a minute. Moses had issues. I don't have time to unpack them, but if I was... A clinical psychologist, I would look at and unpack Moses through a character study, and I would look at Moses, who had all kind of issues. You, the reason that he was the way he was and why he was limited is because he was born. The Bible said when they looked at him in childhood, they knew that he was an Israelite, even though he grew up in a royal Egyptian family. Pharaoh's daughter adopted him, but he looked like Israelite. But he was in the house of Egypt. In other words, they probably knew he was adopted. He grew up with trying to fit in, he probably never quite fit in. Then when he sees some of the Israelites being beaten by an Egyptian taskmaster, he goes and says, get up off my people, kills the taskmaster, and then thinks, you know, now he has street cred. <laughs> so he goes and tries to hang out with some of the Israelite slaves, and as he's trying to hang out there, and they're in a dispute. He says, you guys shouldn't do like this. You listen, you should love one another. One of them gets attitude, looks at him like, wait a minute, hold up, killer. This is the Wayne Cheney translation. He said, we know what you did. You want us to report what you did? Because we'll snitch in a minute if you don't get up out of here, rich boy. He goes away and he sits in the desert in isolation. Well, he did learn the desert. The upside is he learned how to walk the wilderness. The downside is he had a difficult time often in his interaction with people. It's one of the limitations that kept him where he was. And I know there's some people with some issues with people. But whatever you have to do, whether you have to come up in prayer every single week, you have to get through this issue with people. I know there's a curse word in certain places, but not here. If you need therapy, go get you some good therapy. I got two claps. I got two claps. I, 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 I do both of those, but I got to get through this issue. People. So now, third reason God limits is when I don't recognize his glory or credit to his glory through my life. He says, stay here until you realize it's me and not you. Number two, he limits when he's, we try to go into our destiny alone. He says, no, you need to bring some folks with you. He says, get the people issue together. The third reason God limits, and I'm done with this one, is when we don't learn 
how to evolve. I love Zornberg who says, of the children of Israel calling to look back or to go into back to Egypt, she says, long before there was ever the death of their bodies in the wilderness, there was first the death of their imagination. Yeah, when I, when I get in the struggle, when I've been at the holding pattern for so long that I can't even see the possibilities anymore, when I'm no longer, because it, what's ahead of me is so difficult, I can't believe God to create new possibilities. I can't believe, or b believe that God would create new pathways forward. I, I can't see what God could do with this mess before me anywhere, anywhere or any way. So I, what I start to do is I start to look back over my shoulder to what God has done. When you're in a mess in your present, the mess of your past somehow looks better. The term used for it is mystifying. Mystifying is when you look back at your past and call it the good old days, and the reality is you were going through the same stuff back then as you're going through now. Are you still here with me? You just remember the good parts of what you call the good old days. Are you with me? Because your today is difficult. But can I tell somebody, don't look back and say the best is behind you. Please understand there is prophetic vision for the future. I don't care what scenario you're in. I don't care what happens in culture around us. The church will still be relevant. God's purpose will still be relevant. You can live and not die. Are you still here with me? There are divine possibilities ahead of you. Put your hand on somebody's shoulder because you don't know what they're going through. Tell them there's a future for you. Yeah. Man, I don't care what it looks like. Interestingly, yeah, yeah future for you. Moses, standing before the people on the verge of the promised land, they said, we want some water. Moses put on the spot because God tells him to speak to the rock and water will come out of that rock. Moses decides, I'm not going to speak to the rock because I know what works. God, I've been doing this so long that even though I hear you leading me in a different direction, what is in my hand is more real than what is in my ear. This thing that I've come to depend on, I know how to work this. God, I know you're calling me to my business, but I know how to work this job. God, I know he ain't. I know she's not much. I know she has a wandering eye. But I know this one. So I'm going to stick with what I've been using. I'm in between gigs right now. This sugar daddy. He's keeping my IG popping. And what we want is, we want our destiny, our God-given destiny, while holding on to what he's told us to let go of. It's my crutch. It's my walking stick. It's what I depend on. God says, but here's before you go to your destiny, he says, can you lay it down? Can you give it up? And here's the challenge. I can't give up this walking stick that I've come to depend on because now people are watching me. Are you still here with me? And you're asking me to do something I've never done before. You're asking me to believe for something I've never believed. You've taken me for 40 years, used the stick. Now you're telling me when everything counts to put down the crutch, to put down the stick, and to open up my mouth. God says that's exactly what I'm telling you to do. Moses 
it says, I, but I can't let go of my stick. I got to hit the rock. God says, okay, you got results, but what you'll never know is that you missed your entire destiny. And God sent me in this place to tell some people that what's held you back is your unwillingness to drop the stick. You may get results right now, but baby, the results are nothing compared to the destiny God has. And I know what the theologians are saying. They're saying, Pastor, because I studied too. They said the rock represents Christ, and it does. Because the first time he would be hit, he would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, but he would not be crucified again because he's been beaten for us. The second time we go boldly to the throne of grace so we can speak to him. First he was struck so that we have permission and the right to open up our mouth and to speak to the God that was crucified for us. So I know Know that the rock represented Christ but that does not discount the struggle of Moses and his destiny God says he says Moses can you drop the stick and open up your mouth and do what you've never done before speak to the rock say water come out Moses says nah he takes him for 40 years the wilderness Moses said I can't do it because I become dependent on results with this method so God, you're telling me to retool and, and, and I can't, you, you built me up in private, but now you're telling me to retool in public. You're telling to me to believe you with an audience. You're telling me to follow you with people watching me and watching. And can I tell you one of the things that works against the presence, present move of God is a past reputation. They've seen me work with this stick for 40 years. Now you want me to do something I've never done before? God says that's exactly what I want you to do to release this next level of glory because this ultimately is not about the water that's getting ready to come out of this rock. This is to see whether you're the kind of leader that can possess the next place, who can walk into the next place, who will say yes to me when everyone else says no, who will claim my name when everyone else is embarrassed to do so, who will give me the glory no matter what it cost them before people and isn't it interesting he didn't tell him as we close he didn't tell him to punch the rock and water will come out he didn't tell him to kick the rock and water will come out he did not tell him to throw a rock at the rock and water will come out Listen to me. He says, Moses, I need to know before I upgrade you and give you access to things that you've only dreamed about. I need to know that you can open up your mouth and speak to the rock. Why? Why? Why did Moses have to open up his mouth and speak to the rock. This is not a name and claim it. Why did Moses have to open up his mouth and speak to the rock? Because it was 40 years ago that God called Moses and he said, I want you to go and be my mouthpiece. I want you to go and talk to Pharaoh and tell him what thus saith the Lord. And Moses said, but God, 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 I, I can't, 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 I can't speak. So what God did is he took him for 40 years to the wilderness and showed him that he was faithful and showed him that he was with him and told him, showed him that he would never leave him or forsake him, that we would never let him, his back be up against the wall and him not rescue him. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from every sin single one of them he showed him that he walked with him and he talked with him for 40 years so that when he got to the moment before crossing in he wouldn't just trust that God would use a rod but would trust 
that God would use the thing that he called a weakness the thing that he doubted himself about the thing that caused him to say God could never use me I don't have enough education I'm not smart enough I don't sing well enough there are people that are more talented than I am he said I need to know that you can not only give me your strengths but is there anybody in the house that can give God their weaknesses that can give God their frailty that can give God their brokenness that can give God he said I know you're divorced but can you give that to me yeah and believe I'll still move through you I know you have bodies on you but can you give that to me I know that there are people in your own church that used to see you when you tore up the club and the enemy's been holding you back with every gift on the inside of you causing you to say God will never do anything with that weakness but the thing for some people in this place is going to break the barrier to your next place. Listen to me. Hear me. Is your ability to believe that God can do something with your weakness. Yeah. We're done. Listen. But do you know the first manifestation of the fall? When Adam and Eve in the garden and ate of the forbidden fruit, the first manifestation of the fall was not that they put clothes on or sold fig leaves around themselves. The first manifestation of the fall, the Bible says they realized that they were naked. Listen to me. They realized that they were naked. The Bible says... they sold fig leaves it wasn't that they sold fig leaves but the first manifestation of the fall is the same thing the devil is using today and is that it was that they became self-conscious before they just looked at the Lord and followed his instruction they communed with one another and carried out the plans of the Lord, but when sin entered in, the first manifestation, one of the most potent tools of the enemy, is to get your eyes off what the Lord says. And back on yourself. If somebody in this place like Moses was kept you from your destiny, is your own self-consciousness. Because now God is calling you to obedience before a crowd. And you can no longer see the possibilities. You can no longer see the Lord, but all you see is your frailties. You see your weaknesses. You see your vulnerabilities. You see your inability. And God says, listen, lift your head up. Get your head up. Get your head off yourself. Listen, I have a destiny for you. I have a plan for you. He said, I want you to see that there's more ahead of you. Get your head up and look at me again. That's why when Jesus came, he was speaking of hearing from the Father, but he didn't use the word, I only hear. He said, I only do what I see my Father doing. To reveal that he reversed the curse of Adam. And no matter what it feels like, no matter what the crowds say, God, my eyes are fixed on you. My eyes are not on myself. I'm not nursing my self-consciousness. If you say I'm a more than conqueror, even if I feel weak, I'm going forward. God, if you say that I'm a mighty man of God, even with mistakes in my life, I am who you say I am. God, even with broken relationship, God, if you say that I'm a mender, I'm a healer, God, I say yes. My eyes are back on you. I came to talk to some folks that are on the verge of destiny, but it's evaded your grasp. God sent me in this place to tell you, for some of you it is to give God the glory through your life. And the doors will open. For others in this place, 
is to realize that you can't do it by yourself and you've come as far as you can alone. But then the third revelation is this. If you give God your weakness, your frailty, and say, Lord, I will no longer use this as a crutch. God says, you won't have to die on Pisgah like Moses, but you can start to attain, you can start to grasp the very thing you've been believing for, the thing that you've been hoping for, the dreams that he's been speaking over your life. He said, they can become a reality if you could get your eyes back on me believing that I will do the impossible. We're all out of time, but if that's you in this place, you say, I've been limited, and it's not the devil. I, I've tried to fast through this. God says this is changing with a revelation of what needs to shift. If you're here in this place and that's you, I want you to lift your hands. Lift your hands. I want to speak a prayer of blessing over you. I want to pray that God opens up your eyes, that he gives you a revelation of what it is and where it is. Because he hadn't brought you this far for you to die on the mountain. Yeah, he hadn't brought you this far and you haven't believed this long. And you haven't seen his hand this much for you to die where you are. No, God says you're going in. You're going in. And that's why you can't do this by yourself. Because the person standing on your left and on your right is going to drag you in. If you don't want to go in by yourself, they're going to remind you of how big your God is. They're going to remind you that with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And when you are weak, they're going to be strong. When you're frail, they're going to be lifting you up. They're going to remind you that this is where we're going. Together, if you're here and that's you, let's lift our hands. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for every hand lifted. Lord, I pray your blessing, your favor over these, your people. I pray now, God, by the power of your spirit that you bring revelation that will remove barriers of limitation. Oh, Lord, and delight us with the good and perfect things that you've prepared for us since before the foundation of the world. Now, Lord, we commit to give you the glory we commit not to do this alone and we commit to lay down our rods to give you even the frailest parts of ourselves as we lift our eyes unto the hills for whence come our help we know that all of our help comes from you so we'll look to you and believe you for all that you will do in and through us. And all those who agree with the prayer and believe that God will do it, let me hear you say amen. amen. Now listen, don't move, don't move. I want you to understand now that it's time, it's time to give. And I thank you for your faithfulness and presence, even in your pastor's absence as every leader needs to be refreshed, encouraged to hear from God afresh while we stay faithful. It, this blesses me. I wish every church was this blessed. Listen to me.